you have a Bible, why don't you open with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Two weeks ago, I was talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the day of Pentecost, and how God poured out his Spirit on all flesh. And I said, I want to follow up with the gifts of the Spirit. So this week and next week, uh, we're going to be covering the gifts of the Spirit, the operation of spiritual gifts. And so today we're in 1 Corinthians 12. Next week, we're going to do 1 Corinthians 14. Those two chapters are really um, like bookends to the spiritual gifts and the operation. Some people would ask, well, why do we even need spiritual gifts? Do we need them today? Is it something that, that you, you might have heard this, maybe some of your friends are a part of a congregation, they say that the gifts have ceased, miracles have ceased, that was just necessary to get the church started in the first century. And, but I don't see any evidence in Scripture, and I know that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so I personally have experienced him in miraculous ways, so I, I have that experience. It's hard to argue with a man who has experience, but I have the experience of God working wonderfully, miraculously in my life. And so I want to contend for this, and I want us to be a congregation that contends. Why do we need it? Because we're battling an enemy, the enemy of our soul, the, the God of this world, the scripture says, who, who wants to hold us back. We're battling our flesh. And so what do we need to do the, the great commission? Make disciples of all nations. Become the church. God's hand extended on earth. What do we need? We need supernatural power. We need supernatural power to do supernatural work. Now, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but... Every time, every once in a while, the choir just needs to hear it. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I want to read through this and just make some remarks. It's not, a, not so much of a um, detailed teaching. A detailed teaching could take months in this passage. But I, I wanted to give us an orientation to it and an encouragement. Chapter 12, verse 1. Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters... I do not want you to be uninformed. That first sentence says gifts, the gifts of the Spirit. Everyone say gift. Yeah. The thing about gifts is they're free. You don't have to do anything to earn them. It's not a spirit. This is not a spiritual maturity issue. You don't have to hit a certain hierarchy before you get to operate in spiritual gifts. And this is not talking about like how important you are to God. You don't have to earn this. It's a grace gift. It's given just simply because God wants to use us to do his work. I don't want you to be uninformed. Verse 2, you know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is cursed. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. The apostles addressing something of the context. In Corinth, it was a sinful city. It was, they, they call uh, Las Vegas a sin city. That was nothing compared to Corinth. Corinth was sin city, and they had all kinds of idolatry, all kinds of weird worship, and weird ways of manifesting their, their worship to these idol, de demon idols. Paul's saying this is different from that, and don't confuse the two. Verse 4, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in them, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. It's interesting, in these couple of passages, a couple of verses right here, he outlines not only the spiritual gifts, but the gifts all together. There's three sections of gifts that the Apostle Paul writes about in the New Testament. The first one is spiritual gifts, which we're going to talk about in a moment. But he also mentions, and he says, different kinds of gifts. Secondly, he says, different kinds of service. He's talking about the gifts that we are, the office gifts, and we'll talk about that in a second. And thirdly, it's the gifts that God puts in us. They call that the motivational gifts, the the spiritual gifts are in 1 Corinthians 12. The office gifts are in Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to give you the heads up on that right now, show you that. Verses 11 and 12. 
Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12 says this. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers for works of ministry to what? Equip the saints to do the work, right? So those are the office gifts. And then we have the motivational gifts in Romans chapter 12. It says this in verse 6 through 8. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, amen, he mentioned the spiritual gift in this, in this one, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. Oh, wait, wait, is that a spiritual gift, serving? Yeah. But it's a motivation. It's something that God puts in us. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give genera- generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. All these gifts, these gifts are given by God in order to build up the body of Christ, to become like Jesus, so that we would be mature and complete, lacking nothing. How's that? But there's different kinds of gifts. Now we're going to head back to 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7. Talk about the spiritual gifts. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Everyone say good. So in other words, the gifts of the Spirit are not for tearing people down. They're not for criticizing. They're not for discouraging. You don't have the gift of correction. That's not in, because that's, what does the correction do? Oh, I can can find a flaw anywhere. That's easy. You don't even need a gift for that. Everyone in this place has got flaws. That's not the issue. The gifts of the Spirit build up. They're for edifying. They're for encouraging, for the common good. Verse 8, to one there is given through the Spirit a, and this is the list of the nine gifts, a message of wisdom, to another the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing, by that one spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Now, there's a partnership in the, with the gifts. God says, I want you to seek the gifts, but he determines where they go for his purposes. The gift, let's go through them. One is wisdom, divinely inspired understanding. It's beyond your knowledge, beyond your, you know, because well, that guy's an old soul. He just has a way of knowing stuff. No, it's beyond your knowledge. It's the wisdom and understanding that comes from God. And then number two is knowledge, gift of knowledge. So this is understanding information. It's divinely revealed information. It's, uh, some, maybe you were in, I remember one time I was in a prayer circle, and my first experience with the gifts of the Spirit was this guy was praying for me. He didn't know my situation. He just started calling out stuff in my life, and I did, he didn't know what I was going through. It was the gift of knowledge. He was reading my mail. And it was God's way of getting my attention that God was concerned about those things. And it was an affirmation. It was so encouraging. The third one is faith. The gift of faith is the ability to believe God for anything. Anything. God wants us. I mean, he wants us to do the miraculous, right? All things are possible. But there's a gift that's given to, to people, for, and sometimes for different situations, To believe for the miraculous, to believe, to believe for the impossible, the gift of faith. Number four is healing, the ability to heal the sick. It's the gift that God promises, and it's in Mark chapter 16, where it says that they will, they will those who follow me, they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Jesus said, you will do the works that I do and even greater works. That's part of what Jesus' ministry. All these things are actually the part of Jesus' ministry. Number five is miracles. Maybe a little bit different than healing because maybe it's not a physical body kind of a thing, but it's the miraculous. It's seeing something amazing happen. 
and God using us at a time and place to do his work and his will, like Jesus turning water into wine. That was a miracle. Or maybe Paul shaking off the snake off of his, off of his hand into the fire. It was a miracle that God got people's attention. There's something about miracles, guys. I want to encourage you. Miracles are God's purposes. We call them signs and wonders. They're signs and wonders to, to get us going the right direction, to attract attention to the people. And God's using signs and wonders many times in order to like, start churches. You'll see a lot of, um, you see people with the gift of miracles on the mission field. Uh, you know, we don't have, we don't use the name very often anymore, apostles, because it's been abused. And so people started, it became so common, people started getting business cards, says, I'm the apostle so-and-so. And we're like, that just turns us off, because, you know, you're just self-promoting, and it's a lot of spiritual pride. But the fact is, usually missionaries are apostolic, and they usually work in the gift of miracles in order to start new works and break into new ground. Prophecy, number six, divinely foretelling things to come. Now, there's two kinds of prophecy. This one's talking about divinely understanding what is to come, but there's another kind of prophesying, and we'll talk about it next week in uh, chapter 14, and that's the prophetic word, which is basically speaking God's word one to another. But this is the gift of prophecy, the gift of understanding or being able to say what's in the future. Number seven is discerning of spirits. The ability to recognize demonic spirits. You can tell right off the bat, and some of you have that. Um, you know, it's the, like, spidey sense. I've heard people call it, you know, I got spidey sense. I can feel something weird here, and, and they just kind of know something's off. And they recognize that there's a spiritual battle involved. Number eight is tongues, speaking God's message in another language. It's what happened on the first day of Pentecost, that outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the, the Disciples were filled. They began to speak in other languages. They went out in the streets and started talking to people in different languages. And people recognized it from different areas of the world. They recognized God speaking to them in their own language. That's pretty amazing. But God was using that opportunity to speak his word even beyond our own understanding. Kind of goes with the, the number nine, and that's the interpretation of tongues. The ability to decipher tongues. I remember, um, this was probably 15 years ago, I was in a uh, class with Pastor Jack Hayford. I got a, an opportunity to spend a week with him along with about 40 other pastors. At the end of the week, um, he took a, the whole morning and spent time praying for each one of us. And I remember he came to me and he just put his hand on my shoulder and instead of speaking in English, he just began to pray in the spirit, in tongues. I didn't know what he was saying. But God was using the opportunity to reveal to him something. And so he interpreted what that was. He began to prophesy over my life. He began to speak things over my life that no one else knew, that people actually had said to, to me about my life a year earlier. So confirming what God's will was for me. And it's, it's a supernatural, miraculous thing. Well, you can say, well, I, I don't have that experience. I don't know if that's for today. I want to encourage you, don't let your experience determine your theology. Don't put a box around God because you haven't had that experience. Let your, exper let your theology be based on God's word. And then, then say, Lord, I want my experience to be what your word says. That's what I want my experience. I want everything that you say in the Bible, I want it all in my life. That's what I want. That's what I can expect. The promises of God are yes and amen. So that's, that's what I'm contending for. Those nine gifts. We need the nine gifts. It goes on in verse 12. It says this. It says, get a drink of water before your voice gets too crazy. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all... Of its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, we were all given the one spirit to drink, the Holy Spirit. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, 
but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. And if the ear should say, I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. I, I, I tell you, that some people don't believe that they're necessary. Like, I, I'm just an ear and the body doesn't need me. Are you crazy? The body needs an ear. Or I'm, like, I love this, I'm just a little toe. I'm just a little toe. I, I don't know about you guys, but I've, I've broken my little toe before. And uh, that cripples your whole life. Your whole life is wrecked when your little toe is broken. Because it's the smallest little thing. It's like barely hanging on there. <laughs> but it's magnetically pulled to, to the uh, post on a table, isn't it, aren't they? <laughs> Bam. I'm not that necessary. I'm not, like, you know, highlighted. You know, God doesn't really need me. Most people... I really believe, you know, this is my experience. Most people think that they're insignificant. They're not, they're not necessary. I just want to say, that's a lie of the devil. It's a lie of the devil that you're not needed. Now, a lot of times, you know, because there's someone with a microphone on a stage and you're listening this way, uh, a, a lot of churches get what we call pastor-centric or focused on a, one leader. And, you know, they kind of expect that leader to do everything, and that's just not biblical. It's not biblical at all. We're all a part of the body, and God, I mean, God, I am a part of the body. I'm the exhorter. I'm the teacher. I'm the encourager. That's my spiritual gift. And I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do. Are you doing what God's called you to do? Because when we all do what we're supposed to, it's powerful. It's a beautiful thing. Verse 21, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. The head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. Now, that's on the opposite. Well, the first one was, I'm not necessary. The other one is, I don't even need you. Like, I'm better than that. I don't need that little toe, that little stinky, stubby toe. Don't need it. Well, we all need each other. In fact, the truth is, when we get to the point where we say we don't need one another, that is spiritual pride, and it stinks to high heaven. If we think we're good enough, or we don't need the pe person sitting next to us, we think we're at a spiritual level way above them, and we can't learn from someone else. I've already read the Bible, you know, 10 times. Oh, good for you. Good, that's good. If you stop learning, you're done. You're done in the kingdom. You can't grow. You just get to a point of spiritual pride, and it is a killer. I'm way ahead of them. I should be teaching them. They shouldn't be. I shouldn't be listening to them. We need one another. Verse 22. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. The parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. The parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment, but God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it. So that there should be no division in the body, but its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffer, every part suffers with it. One part is honored, every part rejoices with it. There, there's something really powerful in, in this passage. It's a kingdom dynamic. I, I think a lot of times people will, you know, say, uh, especially for me, I hear people saying, you know, we appreciate you, pastor. Thank you for be, doing what you do. And um, but are you saying the same thing to the nursery worker? This, this passage, listen, this passage says, I don't really need the kudos. I don't need the applause. 
The people that really need it are the ones in the background, the ones who are in the prayer room right now, who you don't, you don't even know who's in there, and they're praying for you right now. They need the encouragement. They need the affirmation. They need us to value them. It's more important for us to do that. It's a kingdom dynamic, and it's this. The last will be first. You see, it's a, it's a kind of upside-down thing about the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of this world. You know, Jesus said, you know, my kingdoms are not the same as the kingdoms here. They're different. Of course they're different. They're different in that our kingdom is based on servanthood. We call people leaders. That term is very rarely used in the Bible. Really, you look in the New Testament, I think it's used three times. That's it. You know what the, you know what the term is for people of spiritual service? It's called servant. Servant. It's just the opposite of what the world would say. I'm on top. I'm leading. No, I'm a servant. I'm lifting. And it's just different. Why is it that the weaker parts are more important? Why does it say that? I mean, it's, is it really true? Paul says this in 2 Corinthians. He says, my power is made perfect in weakness. Oh, God, I'm just, I'm hopeless without you, Lord. I can't make it day one, square one. I can't go anywhere without you. That's a good place to be. That point of weakness, that point of desperation, that point of need. When we see the lack of our own ability to do anything that God called us. Verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, here's another list. Paul likes lists. First of all, apostles. Second, prophets. Third, teachers. Then miracles, gifts of healing, of helping. Whoa, whoa, helping. How'd that get in the list? No, really, look at that list. Apostles, prophets, teachers, miracles. Wow, powerful, good, credible. And gifts of healing and helping. He's talking about the motivational gifts there, guidance, and then back to the spiritual gifts, different kinds of tongues. Verse 29, are all apostles? No. The question is obviously no. Excuse me, if I don't blow my nose, you guys are going to regret it. Apostles, no. Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? The answer is obviously not. Why? I can tell you honestly, I feel like those nine spiritual gifts, I've got to experience those in my life, each one of those at one time in my life. But they're not, some of those are just once or twice. Others, others of them more often. Why is it they don't have all the gifts all the time? Because we need one another. And God designed it that way. Eagerly desire the greater gifts. Desire the gifts that build people up, that encourage people. I want to give you a couple things to think about. And then we're going to do something different on a Sunday morning. First is, you are a gift. If you look at God's perspective, each one of us is specifically designed to bless others. You are a gift. <clears throat> now, some of you in your mind are already disqualifying yourself. You think, yeah, but you don't know what I did last week. Doesn't matter. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. Doesn't matter what you've done. It matters what his call is on your life. His call doesn't change. It never changes. Secondly, (coughs) 
You are a gift, number one. Secondly, God gives you gifts. God wants to bestow on you some gifts. Not so that you're going to be all puffed up, not so that you're going to be special, not that you get a parking space, so that you can bless. Thirdly, we all need the gifts. The gifts that are represented in one another, the spiritual gifts, we all need them. Number four, we all need to use them. This morning, I want us to do something Paul says in Timothy. He says, I want you to stir up the gift that is in you through the laying on of my hands. I want you to stir it up. That means you activate it. That means you use it. So we're going to do something. We're going to call this an activation exercise. We're going to speak to one another. We're going to say, this is risky. Pastor, we've never done this in church. I don't know about this. Can I do it? You know what? It's you don't you don't. It's not like like look at me. I'm so good at this. Every time it's a risk. I'm going to ask you to do something in a moment. I'm going to ask you to get with one other person, and I want you to pray for them. I don't want you to ask what the issue is. I don't want you to. I really don't want you to pray with the people you just prayed with. I'd rather be at someone new. Preferably someone you don't know that well. Now, some of you, I'm like, Pastor, you're way out of my comfort zone. I know, but just if you trust the Holy Spirit, listen, if you trust the Holy Spirit, he will do amazing, amazing things. So you just start praying, and you, I want you to take turns praying for one another, and you're going to be cognitive, you're going to be listening and sensing what it is God wants to say. You might be surprised. You might give a prophetic word or a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom. You might pray for someone to be healed. You're not asking what the need is. This is the great part. You're just walking now. You're activating some of the spiritual gifts. I haven't done that before. It's okay. Let your experience be based on what God says. Let's just try a little bit. Now, um, if you, here's something I commonly do. If someone asks me to pray for them and I don't know what the situation is, I'll listen for the, the voice of the Lord. I'll kind of listen for, you know, is that maybe a thought that comes to my mind? I believe that God plants thoughts. And if I don't get anything, I'll ask for a scripture. I like to, I like to do this when I'm praying with someone. Give them a promise of God. Give them something from the scripture that's going to minister truth to their life. And so I love praying scripture, scripture promises over people. And you might feel like, I, I'm too uncomfortable with this, and this is a get to today and not a have to. So you don't have to, but I want, I want to take about five minutes, and we're going, going to have an opportunity to speak and activate the gifts of the Spirit to one another. Listen, we're a congre- Listen, we're a congregation that believes in this. Not only do we believe in it, but we exercise it on a regular basis. Now, it's not always up on a platform, although if you, you, you don't recognize it. I, I, I don't blurt out, hey, by the way, this is a prophetic word for you right now. I just give, it, give you the word. When Danny got up and prayed earlier, he was given words of knowledge. He was really prophetic words, some really good words. But he didn't announce it. This is my gift. Everyone listen. You just do it. And you guys are walking in it in a natural way all the time because you have a supernatural spirit, the Holy Spirit. So this is something we walk in normally, naturally, regularly. You don't have to call attention or get on stage. Although occasionally, if you have a word for the congregation, come on. Come on up. Talk to one of the leaders, Kay or myself or Danny, whoever's up here in the front, and submit it. Say, hey, this is what I sense God's doing, wants to say. Can I share it? And we'll at that point say, well, and I'm talking about this more next week, but, um, well, that sounds like something for you. Maybe you should pray about that. Or maybe you should write it down to be more more, um, detailed or more thought through. Or maybe it's for right now. Let's go ahead and share it. So we'll discern how that's to be used. But... Guys, stir it up. 
Stir it up. Let's get good at this, right? Let's get really good at it. Because the congregation's health, the congregation's maturity, how we do at building and making disciples depends on how well we do some of this. You guys ready for doing something risky? Okay. So I want you to get with one other person, preferably not the person you came with. I'm going to give you five minutes. Go ahead. Let's stand. Go ahead and get with someone. Don't ask them what the need is. Just start praying, one, one after the next. Just start praying. If you have three, okay. You can do three. If someone's left out, don't leave them out. Just two or three, that's all. That's it. Keep praying, guys. Keep praying. Speak God's word.
Doing good, guys. Keep keep going. Some of you are still praying. Keep going. Take a chance. Lord, we pray that you'd stir up the Holy Spirit in us. Stir up the gifts of the Spirit in us to strengthen the body of Christ. Build us up in our holy faith. Encourage us. God, speak to us through one another. We thank you, Lord. We thank you that you're good, that you're faithful, and you're true, that you love us. Thank you for your love, that incomprehensible love. Thank you for the blessing. Lord, I pray for Hope Chapel that we would be a congregation that would grow in our understanding of the gifts, that in our, in our exercise of the gifts, in our maturity with the gifts. Show us who we're supposed to be. Show us those gifts that you've placed in us. And we pray that you get the glory. You get all the credit. We love you, Lord. We thank you. You're so good to us, Lord. 